Welcome to our new sermon series on isms. If you were here last week, our senior pastor, James Hayward, introduced the series of isms to you. What is isms about? Isms is about the things in our culture that divide us, like racism, classism, sexism. These are things that the church is not called to be silent about, but instead to speak about boldly with unity and Christ's love. So today we are going to talk about the ism of racism. So first, the obvious question, why am I talking about racism when James is black and Pastor Eduardo is a Hispanic and I am the white girl? Well, because we are allies. <laughs> In the body of Christ, we are called to be allies to each other. So I'm here talking about it because Pastor James asked me to. And Pastor Eduardo will take on one that perhaps wasn't his first choice. And James will take on one sexism that doesn't apply to him. But we get to be allies and speak up for each other. So in doing this, we want to model what it looks like to speak up for someone else. So I assure you, I'm not up here talking about racism because it's comfortable or easy for me. It is not. Um, speaking about something so challenging is very humbling. And I have no doubt that I will go too far today for some, not far enough for others. But what I want to happen today is not that you are hearing from me, Pam, but that you are hearing the words of Scripture, the words that the Holy Spirit has brought to my heart and mind in the past weeks as I've prepared, has brought to Pastor James as he mentored me as I prepared this message. So with that, I would just love to pray, pray over this message today. God, we come before you today um, as people who either have committed to following Christ or people who are curious about Christ and, you, and the Bible, Lord. And, and so we come seeking your truth, God. We come humbly. I come humbly, Lord. Um, just ask that you fill my words with your spirit, that you fill the hearing with your spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. So why do we need to talk about racism in the first place? After all, Paul in Galatians 3.28 said, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, servant or free, male or female, because you are all one in Jesus Christ. So, shouldn't everyone who follows Jesus just be one big happy Christian family and ignore things like color of skin or economic class or male or female? Now, on the other side of Christ's return... I believe that we will be one big, happy family, diverse, beautiful, and amazing, and have peace in that. Revelations talks about that. But right now, we are in a condition of sinfulness, of a, of a broken world. And so the things that maybe we wish didn't matter, they do matter. I am a child of the 1980s. And the way that I grew up hearing about race was the word colorblind. Who else? Anybody else familiar with the idea of being colorblind? That was literally the only way I ever heard about. That was the norm. That was the height of how you treat other people. You ignore the color of the skin and you love them for who they are. It's a nice sounding idea. But what I have learned what our culture is telling us now, the more we listen to voices we haven't heard so much before, is that color does matter. Now, it doesn't matter because of someone's capabilities or worthiness. It matters because there's a historical way that people have been treated. It matters because there today is still prejudice. And because of that, if we are colorblind, we miss out on the injustice that people are feeling. And so we need to be eyes open as we move forward. So the idea of being colorblind can help us understand explicit bias, but today we also want to talk about implicit bias. So I'm going to help you just kind of think about what those two different things are. The Perceptions Institute says that explicit bias 
refers to the attitudes and beliefs we have about a person or group on a conscious level. So expressions of explicit bias are discrimination or hate speech, um, crimes against someone because of their race or another characteristic. They occur because of deliberate thought. And what's the solution? Well, the solution is to either have moral conviction that it's wrong and change what you're doing, or to just get in line with socially acceptable things and keep your mouth shut and your hands to yourself. But then we also have implicit bias. Implicit bias are attitudes or beliefs in stereotypes without conscious knowledge. Because these thoughts are in our subconscious, it can be hard to recognize them or change them. For example, the perception that someone who speaks English with an accent is less intelligent. The perception that a young black man holding a cell phone actually has a gun in his hand. Multiple studies have documented implicit bias. And the way to begin combating implicit bias is extremely personal. One, you have to recognize that you have it. And friends, we all have it. Two, you have to become a humble student of yourself to see when your biases come out. Now, implicit bias is about more than just race. It can be things like weight or marital status or clothing style. It could have to do with ability and disability. Even age, the ways that sometimes we assume things about teenagers. I have been trying for a couple of years now to, since I learned about these differences, to recognize my own implicit biases. I just, I get the feel, I see my brain going somewhere, and I think, oh, that's not actually might not be true about that person. And since I've done that step of trying to recognize it, I realize one, I do it, and two, I don't like that I do it, and I don't like feeling that I do it, because it's uncomfortable, and it means that I'm human, and that even though I like to think I'm a good person and I'm a pastor, that I'm not perfect. But facing that is part of progress. Today, however, we're going to focus on the racial aspect. So I have to get a little bit college-y here when we talk about what race is. Race was initially used to describe people from certain geographical areas, but around the 1600s, it began to take on the meaning of color of skin. And that's how we tend to use the term now. We, we use it in a way that's controversial and not everybody agrees with because this definition came so much later in history. A related comment, um, concept is ethnicity. And ethnicity encompasses things like food, language, religion, and customs of a people group. Today, for the sake of simplicity, I'm gonna just use, talk about race and racism. Um, but it's important to know that they're different because when you go back and you look in the Bible, those things occurred before the year 1600. And so we don't read about color-based racism. But what we do see in scriptures, we do see ethnic prejudice. And so scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching us. And so we look for ethnicity in the Bible to help us understand today how we should approach race and racism. Additionally, when we look at racism and discrimination globally, it's not always so cut and dry. In the United States, we tend to think of black and white, but racism is very diverse. I was born in South Dakota near a Navajo reservation, I'm sorry, a Sioux reservation, and there were things that people would assume about the Native Americans who live near us. I remember my grandparents saying some really, really horrible and unfair things that my mom and I would process through and, and realize, talk about why that was inappropriate. In the news, we hear reactions against immigrants, especially those from Spanish-speaking countries or from the Middle East. And people say things and assume things about those people groups. Then we have the Armenian-Turkish conflict, Sunni and Shia, Korean and Japanese, Serbs and Croats, Greeks and Macedonians, Tutsi and Hutu, a long history of prejudice against Jews from a variety of groups, and on and on. Racism has been a part of human 
sin since basically sin started. In the U.S., we have a specific burden to focus on because racism is known as America's original sin. Now, as we know, if you've studied United States history, the United States was built on the back of brave and hardworking people. But many of those strong, brave people were slaves. Twelve million persons were forced from Africa to the Americas. Twenty-six percent of them were children. A staggering two million Africans died during the horrific ship journey. While the vast majority of the slaves, they went to the Caribbean and South America, 388,000 came to North America. Their children were also enslaved. And so by 1860, there were nearly 4 million slaves in North America because of those births. And in 1860, it was here in Virginia that had the highest number of slaves of any state. So why do I mention 1860? Well, 1860 is the year that Abraham Lincoln became president, the southern states seceded, and the beginning of the end of legalized slavery in the United States happened. Now, some of you may be thinking, but Pam, that was a really long time ago, and we're not back then. And I don't think my family was involved in slavery anyway. But friends, once the slaves were freed, it was not an easy path to earthly justice and acceptance and equality. There was a long history of continued racism with the Jim Crow laws. There were restrictions in terms of voting and property rights, rights to an education, rights to travel freely, to marry, to be in the same places as white people. It was nearly 100 years later that the civil rights movement happened and widespread progress was made. And that wasn't easy either. So, now we're 60 years out from that. Socially disliking someone because of the color of their skin is taboo in mainstream culture and in mainstream Christianity. Legally, on paper, discrimination based on race or ethnicity is illegal. So, we can just go home now, right? No, that's not the reality we live in. The racism is still happening in our culture. We're going to look at four definitions of racism. The first is that we need to call racism out as a sin. End of sentence, full stop. If I had a mic, mic drop. It is a sin. There is no question about it. Racism is a sin that breaks the two greatest commandments. One, sinning against God by denying equal humanity to people made in God's image. And two, failing to love our brothers and sisters as ourselves. The second definition of racism is the blatant color of sin discrimination. It's prejudice. It's explicit bias. In this definition, the sin of racism is a wrong attitude of one's heart. And the remedy for this sin is personal inward development. But it's not just wrong attention that's racism. Inattention to the experiences of people of color significantly leads to the sin of racism, as we'll see in our next two definitions. The next definition of racism, it looks like an equation. This one says prejudice plus power equals racism. In this case, the sin is not individual. It's the sin is it's corporate, and it belongs to the whole of a group of people who have power and privilege that use that benefit to oppress others intentionally or unintentionally. So there's a conversation that goes on these days that looks something like this. Black lives matter. All lives matter. Yes, but I'm talking about black lives right now. You can't say that. That is reverse racism. Reverse racism doesn't exist. What are you talking about? Seen that on social media? I don't know about you, but that like plays over and over again in my feed. And I hear people talk about it too. 
So why does that happen? Well, if you're looking at this definition of racism, prejudice plus power, then the person who is in power or has privilege cannot be racicized against. They have the power. So I'm not saying you have to agree with this definition, but you have to know it exists because if you're in a co that kind of conversation with someone or you're observing that kind of conversation, clearly one person in that conversation believes that definition. And if you're open to it, you're going to be able to listen better and love better and be healthier and more godly in that conversation because you're not just hitting a roadblock of your own frustration. What do you do with this definition of racism? One, listen. Listen to what marginalized people have to say without explaining their experiences away. And two, speak up. When other people who are in privilege or power say things that continue to oppress, don't say silent. You can speak the truth in love and let them know that that's not acceptable. The last definition of racism we're going to look at today is racism as a system of advantage at a societal level. This is called systematic racism, and it looks at the inequalities that exist between white people and people of color in our culture. Now, systems of advantage are so prevalent, and they range from daily details to big heart-wrenching things. And on the daily detail sort of things, unless you have experienced it, if, you're, if, if you are in a person of privilege, and I will count myself that, as that as a, as a white person, that there's things I've never thought about. So I want to show you a, a very quick little video that someone put on Twitter that just demonstrates what I'm talking about here. Nice. Okay, Noel, you try it out. Come to your honey. Too black or? Too black. Yeah. What I'll Come do again. Or? Come again, Sash. What I have to do to get to get to get to get what do you have to do? That's how a racialist thing is. Yeah. Put some that piece of white. Is that napkin? I'm sure again. That again. Put your napkin. Put your napkin again. Napkin again. Right. Put your hand. What do you call a hand? Man, black man in fight, all over, all over, all over, all over. Oh boy. So what he's he's say, it's the sounds a little bit hard to hear, but he's basically saying, my hand is too black. My hand is too black for the sensor. How does this happen? How does this happen that something can get through and in process of invention and the color of someone's skin can't register? Well, because a lack of scientists of color who are hired to do the job and be tested, be, be involved in this invention and being tested. Which brings us to unemployment. Black unemployment is consistently about twice as high as white unemployment in the United States. If you look compare, uh, comparatively to levels of education, that statistic holds true. So college graduates compared to college graduates, the same issue holds true. In 2016, the median net worth for a white family in the United States was $171,000. The median net worth for a Hispanic family was $20,700. And for a black family, it was $17,600. Again, when you add education, comparing college graduates to college graduates, the picture doesn't get better. Here's two more. Although black Americans aren't more likely to use or sell drugs, they are more likely to be arrested for them. And when black people are convicted of drug charges, they generally face longer prison sentences for the same crimes. Black women in the United States experience a higher mortality rate during birth. 
over two and a half times the rate of non-Hispanic white women. And this is a disparity that is growing, not shrinking. In one paper, researchers included a startling note. They said, some risk factors can be modified through medical care, education, or social support systems, like in the case of people living in extreme poverty. However, racial disparity in outcome is confirmed and is unexplained by traditional risk factors. Traditional risk factors being things that someone could change about themselves. It shows that these examples show us. We could really stay here all day and keep looking at numbers like this that show us the deep way that our culture normalizes white experience. Now, if you are new to the idea of systematic racism, it can stir up strong defensiveness. It can stir up excuses and denial and trying to explain it away or science it away. Um, I took a seminary class a couple of years ago on the theology and ethics of Martin Luther King Jr. So I spent 160 hours one summer in all of these numbers. And it felt like I had somebody took a sack of bricks and whacked me with it. It was brutal. But what was brutal for me to learn is still a mark of my privilege. Because if I had not had that privilege, I would have perhaps lived those experiences. Hearing that, hearing the idea of systematic racism means me, a person who prides myself on ethics and my faith and being non-judgmental and accepting of people, it meant I am still complicit in the sin of racism. And that is not a good feeling, but it does mean that I desperately need Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of God who blankets us all with grace and works towards justice and mercy. Knowing these definitions unlocks a door to greater understanding, to better conversations, to Christ-like love for others, which includes just actions along with words of truth and love. It's a way to better understand Christian faith. For one, if you have been in the United States or studied the history of the United States and looked at slavery, you may have noticed that scripture was used to justify racism, used to justify slavery. And so to have a mature faith, we have to face that and look at what that bad theology was and how we make sure it never happens again and how that causes, how it makes us look at other scripture now so we're interpreting that in right ways. We can also then look at the liberation theology that arose to combat that, that is beautiful and holy things. And I wish we had like three sermons to do this because there's really, really incredible, incredible work that people came out in, in, with explaining why this theology was so bad and so wrong. Additionally, looking at widespread injustice helps us to be humble and recognize how much the Lord loves the oppressed and works for their advance. So where you look at scripture, be on the lookout for these things, how the Lord has this preferential option for the people who are downtrodden to rise them up in his spirit and hope and love and how we get to be a part of that. So let's get into some scripture. Today we're going to be in Acts chapter 10. I'm going to paraphrase some of it, and then we'll call out a few verses as well. But if you have a Bible app or a physical Bible with you and you'd like to follow along, you're welcome to do that. So when Acts 10 opens, we meet a man named Cornelius, who is an Italian military leader in the town of Caesarea. This is in modern-day Israel. So I want you to note the Italian part. This means Cornelius is not from the area. He's not ethnically Jewish ethnically, <laughs> ethnically Jewish. And I also want you to note the military part. He's a member of the occupying force. Now, Cornelius falls under this catch-all term of Gentile that we come across often in the New Testament. 
Although Cornelius is not ethnically Jewish, he has become a devoted follower of the one true God, and he's seeking to live a godly life. One day, he has a vision, and an angel tells him to send for a certain man named Simon Peter, who's in a nearby city. Verse 9 jumps us over to Simon Peter's side of the story. Peter's going about his day, he reaches prayer time, and he ends up having a vision of his own. Verse 11, he saw the heaven opened up and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then he heard a voice saying, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. Now, some translations simplify Peter's words as saying, but God, I've only ever eaten kosher food. So <laughs> the voice says to him again, get up. I'm sorry, he says to him again, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. Or the NIV says, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back up to heaven. Now, Peter is baffled by this vision of God telling him to break with the norms of his culture, with the rules that are sacred to his people. Then Cornelius arrives, Cornelius's crew arrives, and they give Peter kind of a summary of what has happened. And Peter starts to get a clue about what this vision was preparing him spiritually for. Peter ends up going with them, and then they get back to Caesarea. And he gets to Cornelius' house. And then there's this huge faux pas that happens. Cornelius, now Cornelius knows God, and he's living a way like the way, like that Christians are doing, but he, he doesn't actually, hasn't received the Jesus peace yet. So Cornelius has had this vision. It says you're going to meet Simon Peter. Simon Peter comes, comes up to Cornelius' house. They meet. And Cornelius falls to hit the ground and starts worshiping Peter. Okay, Peter is Jewish. Peter knows no idols. And here he is being treated like an idol. This is an enormous, enormous cultural faux pas. Guess what? When you interact with people from different cultural backgrounds, this is a thing. There are things that we do that we have no idea that are offensive. But don't let that stop you from genuine, heartfelt communion with other people. You don't know what you don't know until you know it. So go forward with grace and openness and chat about the things that are different. So Peter corrects Cornelius's understanding and has him get up. Stand up. I'm only a mortal, he tells him. And then he names this incredible tension that must be going on in the room. He went in and he found that many people had assembled. And he said to them, <clears throat> you yourselves know that it's unlawful for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. Now this is, at the time, a truly revolutionary cross-cultural moment. They are meeting against the law. They are meeting against what is socially acceptable. And these are two people committed to seeing God's image in each other above anything else. So what happens next? Cornelius shares his story, and Peter listens. Then Peter makes a bold statement of his brand new embracing of, recon of racial reconciliation. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Then Peter talks. He tells his story. He tells his story of his time with Jesus, and Cornelius listens. They find common ground, the common ground of faith. Again, as this played out, it was revolutionary. This was new in the history of Christian faith. 
They were people from wildly different backgrounds, from minority and majority, from indigenous to occupying force, and here they were coming together to really listen to each other. Now, while Peter lays out the story of Jesus, his miracles and goodness, his unfair death on the cross, that he rose on the third day, that he brought his followers hope and a job, a job to proclaim God's truth. While Peter lays all of this out, the Holy Spirit comes over the room. The pieces that Cornelius and his friends were missing, the Jesus piece, they finally get it. That last piece of the puzzle of their faith clicks together and the Holy Spirit comes on them. The chapter wraps up like this. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter, aka his friends of the Jewish heritage, were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. Again, this is a revolutionary, mind-changing moment. They heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? In other words, could you doubt that they are any less of God than we are? And the answer, of course, is no, no, we can doubt this no longer. God has made it abundantly clear that his way is for everyone. So Peter ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. This radically counter-cultural, rebellious unity went on for days in the name of Christ Jesus. Their ethnic differences were no longer to divide them. They were one in Christ. Now, this passage reflects four ways to move forward in truth and away from racism that apply to us today as well. The first, be a story catcher. Release stereotypes about whole groups of people. Pick getting to know people as individuals. Now, in order to catch stories, you have to have conversations. And I don't mean social media conversations, I mean like actual conversations. In order to have these sorts of conversations, you have to have relationships. If you want to know the highs, the lows, and the middles of someone's life, you have to know them. A stereotyping response might be that I assume my Spanish-speaking neighbor is here illegally. A story-catching response would be to care more about my neighbor than his ethnicity and to go and get to know him and chat with him. And perhaps after a long period of relationship, I might be blessed with knowing more about his background that I know now. You have to be more interested in the person than their ethnicity. And it is then that you get the blessing of the richness, the tapestry of people's stories. Two, know that you are more than your scars. Scar tissue, when it builds up, it's tough and it's inflexible, but in Christ, you are more than that. If you have been on the side of perpetuating the harmful things we've talked about today, intentionally or unintentionally, you are more than your sins and mistakes. The forgiveness of Christ offers a way forward. The power of the Holy Spirit in you can move you to change those behaviors and move forward as a person of increasing peace and justice. If you have been on the receiving side of the harmful things we've talked about today, you are more precious than the way you have been treated. Through Christ Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can find healing and hope. Which brings us to point three, embrace your ethnicity. At the end of Acts 10, as we move on to the later part of Acts, Peter goes on to navigate his Jewish heritage with his identity in Christ. He has to figure out his own story and his own faith and how that looks. Now, we don't know what happened to Cornelius, but I imagine he probably went on to continue being an Italian military leader. Their ethnic background wasn't erased by faith. Instead, the body of Christ grew more mature through its diversity. Mark 12, 31 tells us to love others as we love ourselves. 
However, to complete both sides of that equation, you must actually love yourself. Love your story. Love your body. Love the way that God created you and your family of origin. You are made in the image of God. For a lot of history, Western ideals have held power across the globe, and it's made us think somehow that Christianity is Western or English-speaking or white. But Christianity is an ancient religion of the Middle East. Judaism is an ancient religion of the Middle East. Christianity is a religion of many tribes, tongues, and nations. Revelation 7-9, imagine, talks about this view of heaven where there's a great multitude no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb. We are meant to be unique, created in the image of God, and one body. Four, pick Jesus above all else. In Christianity, When we put something above God, that is called idolatry. Now, Cornelius' moment of idolatry was looking for a person to bow down to. Peter's idolatry was in rules over relationship. But there's different cultural idols out there as well. Education, machismo, ancestors, climbing the social ladder, success, money, power, politics in the flag. Pick Jesus as your number one instead. The common framework of Christ is incredibly healing and allows you to move towards that verse I shared at the beginning of service. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now I'd love to just end the message right there. We bathed it in Jesus. That feels really good. But... We are a body of Christ here. We're part of a global body of Christ, but we also have our own microcosm of that in the room. So I have to have a little family meeting for those people who call this place home. And if you are a guest today, we're so glad you're here. Um, Thank you for letting us address our underbelly here for a minute. All of the steps that I just talked about, those are individual steps. And I hope that in the days and weeks to come, you will think about those things and, and figure, pray about them, read scripture about them, talk with them about friends and family, journal about them. Um, but remember our definitions of racism weren't just about individuals. They were corporate. So listen to this. Joy Cron writes this. Our continual failure to root out the racism of our hearts, our congregations, and our structures will have deadly consequences. Unrepented, continual sin brings death. It always has and it always will. Sin brings death to individuals and sin brings death to communities. We need to root out racism because it is a sin and sin kills the true church. So I have to ask the hard question of, what would it take for Calvary Church to be fully welcoming of all ethnicities? Now, don't write this off and say, but I am welcoming. Yes, you're right. You are welcoming. Thank you. Thank you for the welcome that you give when people walk in these doors. But if we were to just do a little survey of what our ethnicities are in this room, we would see that it scales heavily white. Yet, one of our values as a church is that we are mosaic, is the term that Pastor James uses. And what that means is it means that we want to be made up of all colors, all ages. So, how do we get there? What are we doing unintentionally that somehow is is missing that mark of the diversity of this area where we have a Spanish-speaking congregation that meets here, where we have a largely Korean-speaking adult daycare that meets. There's something, there's a piece that's missing, and and I'm not asking that to point fingers. I'm not asking it because I have an answer. Um, I'm not pointing fingers, and I definitely don't have an answer. This is something, like, I have no, I have no answer to, and lots of churches have no answer to. Yet, there is a holy stirring to figure out what it is 
that American Christianity is missing, to figure out what it is that our individual congregations are missing. Martin Luther King Jr. coined this phrase that the 11 o'clock hour on Sunday is the most segregated hour in America. And here we are decades later, and we might still say that same thing is true. The Lord wants to move in us to figure out how to get beyond that, to truly be welcoming of all ethnicities. I want to end this message with a prayer from Dr. King. Dear Jesus, come and sit with us today. Show us the lies that are still embedded in the souls of America's consciousness. Unmask the untruths we have made our best friends, for they seek our destruction. And we are being destroyed, Lord. Reveal the ways the lies have distorted and destroyed our relationships. They break your shalom daily. Jesus, give us the courage to embrace the truth about ourselves and you and our world. Truth, we are made in your image. Truth, you are God and we are not. You are God, money is not. You are God, jails and bombs and bullets are not. And Jesus, give us faith to believe. Redemption of people, relationships, communities, and whole nations is possible. Give us faith enough to renounce the lies and tear down the walls that separate us with our hands, with our feet, and with our votes. Amen. Here at Calvary Church, we end our service with a time of response where we rise and sing or spend time in contemplation. We also have additional ways to move around our auditorium here and respond. You could come to an altar and pray or confess. We have prayer minister, trained prayer ministers in the front. We have unattended altars in the back. Today, you wanna, may want to go to the back of the auditorium and take communion. One, as a reminder of what Christ has done for you, but also as an act of community with the diverse body of Christ. You may want to go to the cross that we have, and there's post-it notes and tape and pens there, and maybe write your name down as a person who is committed to navigating what it means to be part of racial reconciliation, to figure out how to help that Galatians passage come true, come to fruition here at Calvary Church. Let's stand in response to today's message.